let's uh, let me talk for a minute, and then we'll do questions at the end. That, okay. All right. Because I want to talk about how we're going to get this done. Because John, you asked a very pertinent question: How in the world do we get a legislature who enjoys having the power and influence that they have to give it up? I'll tell you the answer. Actually, is pretty simple and not complicated. And we've done it several times before over the last four years. And it's simply this. It's good communication first. People have to know what's going on. They need to know what it is they need to fight for. And then it's action. You, it's very simple. Most of the time, pick up the phone and you call your representative and you call your senator, depending on which house we're fighting in, and you let them know, no uncertain terms, that you expect them to support and vote for whatever the issue is, and you'll accept no excuses. And believe me, they'll give you excuses. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples on how this has worked in the past and where it's almost failed in the past. Let me start with what we just fought on, FOIA reform. There was a bill in the House that was introduced two years ago, early 2010, that would have reformed the FOIA laws in South Carolina. By the time it came out of committee, it was very late in this year's session, we're getting close to the crossover date, and it had been amended, and it did three things, the exact same three things that Ashley was just talking about. It ended the legislative exemption to FOIA. It gave them 30 days to respond to FOIA with the information, not just a response that they got it, <coughs> but they had to give you the information and it limited how much they could charge for making copies to whatever the market rate was. They could no longer charge you labor or a dollar a page or two dollars a page like some of them tried to. Those three things, very simple, very straightforward, nothing complicated, and it sat, after it came out of committee, it sat on the floor of the house until we almost missed crossover deadline. And crossover deadline, for those of you who don't know, in South Carolina, there's rules in the House and Senate that if a bill doesn't cross over from one body to the other by a certain date, then it's basically dead. It takes a much larger number of votes to get it passed. And generally, they treat it as dead. They won't even bring it up. So we're getting close to crossover deadline. Campaign for Liberty saw that happening, and we sent out an email alert explaining what was going to happen. That got picked up and sent out all over the state. There's about 90 different organizations around the state that are called Tea Party and Campaign for Liberty and Rhino Hunt and Citizens for Concerned Citizens and all different kind of names kind of generally fall under the Tea Party umbrella. They picked it up and it was all sent out. And guess what? They started giving excuses, playing parliamentary uh, tricks, um, putting their name on the bill, uh, doing things to try to deflect the pressure, saying, well, it's not my fault because so-and-so's got their name on the bill. There's nothing we can do about that. So again, we sent out an email alert, let everybody know what was going on. You guys responded very quickly and let them know that was no excuse, that they better get it done and taken care of or they were in trouble. Well, it moved, it got voted on, and passed literally within minutes before a crossover deadline was reached. Then it went over to the Senate to Larry Martin's subcommittee, mm -hmm. committee, Larry Martin's committee, where it sat again. And now we're getting close to the end of session, where if it dies, then it's dead, and we have to start all over again. <coughs> again, we sent out the email, alerted everybody to what was going on, and you responded again. Pressure on Larry Martin to get it out of his head committee. It came out to the floor of the Senate where Brad Hutto, senator from Orangeburg, put his name on the bill, stopped it dead. Now in the Senate, the rules are set up so that one senator can do what they call put his name on the bill and it stops it dead. It doesn't move. It's on the contested calendar and it never gets a hearing. So we let everybody know what was going on, and again, everybody calls Brad Hutto and puts pressure on him from all across the state. And really, he's only worried about people in his own district because that's the only ones who can vote for him. But it was enough pressure for him to take his name off the bill because I think he knew that Senator John Scott from Columbia was going to put his name on the bill, which he did. And it was near the end of the session, and the bill died. Now, we lost that fight because we started too late. We started near the end of the session. If we'd had more time, we would have gotten that bill passed just like we did with roll call. But the lesson here is one, there was good communication because the email alerts went out and it was repeated by all the different groups and people repeated that out to their friends and let everybody know what was going on. And they picked up the phone and they called their legislator and it moved. It moved every single time until we ran out of time. That works, it works over and over again. 
I'll give you another example, and that was when we had the I-95 Corridor Authority bill come up. Now, I actually mentioned the South Carolina Research Authority. One of the things that they do is they commission studies. One of the studies they commissioned was the human need, the I-95 Human Needs Assessment, which was the genesis of the I-95 Corridor Authority, which was this big new government agency that was basically going to manage the economy, the education, the infrastructure for about a third of our state along the I-95 corridor, all the counties that are along that corridor. The Senate passed it by an overwhelming majority. The House passed it by an overwhelming majority. The governor vetoed it. The Senate overrode the veto by an overwhelming majority. This bill was on its way to being passed and we we're gonna have this brand new agency. And then luckily, I read a report from the South Carolina Policy Council and found out about this agency that was being created. So, um, we were fortunate that last year, when the, the governor's veto was overridden, uh, the House decided to delay their vote on that veto until this year's session. So I had a good three or four months before session started to start getting information out and letting you know what was going on. And let me tell you about Jenny Horn. Jenny Horn is a representative from um, the Charleston area, Somerville. And so the alerts are going out. People are calling their representatives saying, we want you to sustain the governor's veto. We don't want this brand new agency. We don't want all the uh, authority that they're going to get, these unelected people that are going to be appointed. Some uh, of her constituents called me up and said, Talbert, we've got a meeting with Jenny Horn, and uh, we'd like you to come and sit in on it with us. Yeah, I like doing that kind of thing. It's kind of fun, <laughs> especially with these guys, because I knew they were not going to take any slack from her, not any of her excuses. And we went in and met with her, and, um, and she was very adamant that she was going to support this new agency. She voted for it the first time through. She's going to vote for it this time, because we just didn't really understand this, this part of the state needed the government's help. They can't do things on their own. And, uh, and she was going to vote for it. And so that was kind of the gist of the meeting. When we were all leaving, I was standing at the doors, other people were coming out, and a lot of her constituents shook her hand, thank you for your time, Ms. Horn, good luck in your primary. <laughs> thank you for your time, Ms. good luck in your primary. Well, they didn't have anybody to run for yet, but they were intent on finding somebody to run against her. Well, you guys know the rest of the story. The House overwhelmingly supported the governor's veto and killed it. Jenny Horn voted with the governor and supported the veto. <laughs> when they know it's either their job or whatever piece of legislation is, they usually pick their job. One other example, and this is on roll call. Actually, I'm gonna give you two examples on roll call. Um, Larry Martin, if you remember, Larry Martin was very much against the roll call bill two years ago. He said it was unconstitutional, he said it would cost too much. He said it would take too long. We'd have to have a full-time legislature if they recorded their vote on every single bill that they voted on. And you remember, before this started, they only, the Senate, recorded their votes 1% of the time on bills that they passed. 1% of the bills that they passed that they voted on or recorded so that we could research and find out how they voted on your bill. The other 99%, you just had to believe what they said. If they said they voted for it, then that's all you knew. I mean, they might have voted against it, they might have voted for it, but we had no way of proving it because they didn't record their votes. They did it all on voice vote. The House was a little bit better. They reported it 8% of the time. <laughs> Again, this was policy council research that brought all of this to light. Um, so Larry Martin was very much against it. He said it was against the South Carolina, South Carolina Constitution to require them to vote on the record on every single bill that they passed into law. So guy from the upstate called me and he said, Talbert, I got a meeting with Larry Martin. I want you to come to the meeting with me. I said, I've already met with Larry. He's, uh, he's not going to change his vote. He's, uh, you know, he says it's unconstitutional. He said the voting on every section of the budget is just, they, they don't do it that way in the Senate and they're just not going to do it. And I'm not going to waste my time going back in there and talking well, to him. this time it was somebody from Pickens. <laughs> well, this time it was, uh, it was somebody from the upstate. Now, he might have been from Pickens. No, he wasn't. He was actually from Greenville. Oh, really? Okay. But he went in and he talked with Larry Martin. Larry gave him the same spill, and this is what he said, Larry. He said, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do, we're gonna win either way. And Larry was probably taken back, back by that a little bit, and, uh, and, he, and he said, 
what do you mean you're going to win no matter what we do? He said, well, if you vote with us and support this bill, then we'll get a good bill and we'll get a good law and you'll have to vote on the record and we'll know how you vote. He shakes his head and says, yeah, I understand. And, uh, and the guy says, and if you don't, then we'll just get a new senator. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's what changed Larry's mind. I got a feeling there was a lot more that went into it than that, some deals with the governor. But he came out this year, last year, when we passed it, it was last year, and fought very hard to get that bill passed. And it was probably a large reason that we got it through, to his credit. Now, the rest of the story is when we were trying to get the Department of Administration bill through to kind of destroy the Budget and Control Board and bring some more accountability back to the government, Larry fought us on that. And the story is this. One of the senators that are our friend went over and talked to Larry and said, hey, you know, Tea Party folks are for this. You're going to be in trouble if you don't vote for this. He said, no, no, no. He said, I supported roll call. I got them under control. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um... And the other story is this. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of these stories is because, one, you don't accept any excuse from these guys, because they will give you every excuse in the book to try to deflect the pressure. They'll tell you it's not the right time, there's not enough support, it's the, there's no way we can do it. And if you believe them and you back off, then you lose. They will threaten you. If you're good enough, they'll threaten you. Believe me, they do. I spent the night in jail one night because of our good senator here in the Lexington County. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I can't prove it, but the circumstantial evidence is too strong to not believe that he didn't have a hand in it. Um, even the sponsors of bills we have to be careful of because they will give you excuses why it's not the right time because a lot of times they'll sponsor a bill because they want to advance their own political career based on that bill. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about our governor. Um, last session, 2009, 2010, when the bill was first brought up and the House passed it the first time, you, you remember unanimously, um, we had a real hard time getting it to the floor of the House, and you guys helped out a lot on this. We went to the subcommittee meetings, and, and we thought we were going to lose the subcommittee meeting vote, and we had enough people there and enough cameras and enough media that they voted for it. Um, they never would bring it out of committee. We ended up having to make a motion on the floor of the House to get it brought out of committee. And so I had a very long conversation over weeks with Haley. This is back when she was still talking to me. <laughs> to get her to get the, to make the motion. It's a recall motion. It's very simple, and then it's a, a simple uh, vote on the floor of the House to bring the bill directly from the committee to the floor of the House. And she kept putting me off that it wasn't the right time or that, that uh, they were going to have a committee vote on it. And basically, she didn't want to bring the bill out immediately. She wanted to keep it not passed so that she could continue to run on it as governor, for governor, because this is what she ran on for governor. So finally, um, I had a conversation with her, and it, and it was not an ugly conversation, but I basically said, you know, Governor, if this motion doesn't get made quickly, then the people are not going to be real happy. And just let her know that I was going to be letting you know that she was not going to make the motion. She was delaying it. The next day, she made the motion to bring the bill out of the committee onto the floor of the House, and that was on a, uh, a Wednesday. They voted on it Wednesday. Um, and Thursday they had third reading. She was off campaigning. And if you remember, I don't know if you remember the news, but there was a lot of bad press for her not being there mm -hmm. for the final vote on her bill because she was off campaigning for governor. And that's why she didn't want to bring it out because she knew she had another appointment up in upstate for campaigning. But it's worse than that. Fast forward to last year when we actually got the bill passed. Now you remember that one of the primary arguments was that the bill was unconstitutional. And the argument something like this, um, well, there was a compromise made. There was a compromise made, and Larry Martin, I think, was key behind this compromise. And it was, we'll pass the bill, but it won't be effective upon the signature of the governor, which is usually the line that's in the bottom of the bill. Whenever it's passed, they say effective upon the signature of the governor. And that's the way the bill was written. 
But the compromise was this. It will be effective upon passage of a constitutional amendment, which would have been three years from the day that we got the bill passed. Because to get a constitutional amendment passed in South Carolina, the legislature has to vote on it. Then it goes to you in a general election to vote on it. And then it goes back to the legislature to ratify it in the new legislature. So it's a three-year process, basically. So if, if we had agreed to that compromise, we wouldn't have a roll call law today. We wouldn't have the scorecards that we have on how they vote. We wouldn't, they'd still be voting 1% of the time or whatever it is. We wouldn't know how they vote today if that compromise had been reached. Well, I was driving back from speaking up in Horry County and I get a phone call from a friend and, and they say, Talbert, we have got a big problem. I just got a call from a senator who was at the governor's mansion and he had a conversation with one of Haley's staff. And he said that a compromise had been reached, the governor had agreed to it, and it was his, the staff member's job, to bring the Tea Party on board and show them what victory looks like. Basically to convince you that this compromise was good enough. So, remember, this is when Haley and I are still talking, sort of. We've been starting to kind of fall apart by now, because. She's governor now and starting to do some of the things that she's done that are not right. Um, but Tim Pearson, who is her chief of staff, was still returning my calls real regularly. So I immediately hang up with my friend, call Tim Pearson. He doesn't take my call. I leave a message. I said, Tim, this is what I've heard. I need to know if it's true. Because if it is true, I said, I need to know if it's not true. Because if it is true, I'm sending an email out tomorrow to let everybody know because we're not accepting this compromise. I never got a call back from him. So I sent the email out, and some of you remember that. Now, the way it was worded, because see, I, this was a friend who told me, and I didn't have written proof, and I don't send anything out unless I have written proof of it. But I basically said, the governor's under a lot of pressure to compromise. You need to call and strengthen her and let her know that we won't accept any compromise. And you did. You lit up her phone. <laughs> You piled in her email box, and people all across the state did. And she was mad. She was furious. But what she did do, when it came time for the committee hearing, where this bill was being heard, where I believe she would have, had you not done what you did, would have gone in and made a good speech about how this was a victory, the compromise had been reached, the people had a victory, and we won this fight, and as soon as we get a constitutional amendment passed, then we will have roll call as a statute. Now I was sitting in that committee and I was sitting second row back right in the middle and Haley and Tim Pearson come walking in. She doesn't look at me. She doesn't acknowledge my presence and she sits down directly in front of me and she gets up and gives the best speech I've ever heard on why this bill needs to be effective immediately. There will be no compromise and guess what? They did. Wow. They did and that's because of what you did. You would accept no compromise, and you put the pressure on her, who was the bill sponsor, who was the champion of the bill. Mm. No excuses ever from the politicians on compromising with them on how much power and secrecy they get to keep. Right. The only way we'll ever get these reforms passed that they don't want is exactly that. There's no other way it's going to be done. Now, this election cycle, is, we talk about it as a lost election cycle because we have lost a lot of our candidates off the ballot. We've got a heck of a lot of them put back on. 250-something uh, candidates off the ballot. 153 across the state are back on as petition candidates. 300,000 petition signatures collected across the state in about six weeks' time. That is amazing. That is the, a number of people who are awake. That's the power that we have. That's the number of people we can move when we communicate and when we're active. We can get these things done. Now, here's what I ask you to do. Make sure that you are on my email list. I don't send out junk. I don't send out a lot of stuff. I don't forward anything. I don't even get involved in federal stuff, except maybe once or twice a year. It's very extremely rare that you'll get anything that has anything to do with federal level stuff from me. What 
you'll get from me is what's going on in the state house and what you need, what you can do about it, what you need to do about it. I won't send you anything just for information's sake. I'm not going to forward you, um, you know, whatever. What you'll get from me is what's going on, what needs to be done right now, and it's usually a link to whoever your representative is and their phone number and their email address. Give them a call, send them an email. And it's not just you. It's everybody across the state who's doing it and they're going to get flooded and they'll move. And they do. The other thing I'd like you to do is to make sure that you're on the policy council's email list. Because the policy council is the independent research arm that discovers almost everything we need to know about what they're doing to keep their secrecy and their power in South Carolina. They don't get involved in federal stuff. Now, the thing about the Policy Council is they are truly um, nonpartisan, independent. Um, I don't know, Ashley, all the, the all whole list things, of things. That's that right. No, we have special um, interests don't support us. Government doesn't support us. As a matter of fact, when they were fighting the roll call and putting the information out, yeah, right. um, I don't know, but I dare say you guys lost a lot of donors. Oh. Because a lot of the people who um, <laughs> supported the policy council were the politicians, friends, and neighbors, and people. And That's right. When Ashley took over the policy council, yeah, the policy council That's changed right. a little bit <laughs> from being this nice, docile, you know, pat them on the head, thank you for your research um, group, to an in your face. This is what needs to be done. This is how you guys are defrauding the citizens of South Carolina, and this is how it needs to stop kind of organization. And that's been just the last four or five years. So get on their email list. Support candidates who will go in and take the power back. And I'm not talking about those who just go in and say nice things and pat you on the head and say, yeah, 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 I'm going to support what you support. What I'm talking about is those who are full of fire, who aren't going to take anything off of anybody, and who will go in there and expose the corruption, who will tell the stories, who will let you know what's going on. Because I'm going to tell you what, some of these guys that are in there that are friends, they're, they're good folks, they, they vote the right way most of the time, they still protect the system because they won't come out and tell you really what's going on. Like, the time when Bobby Harrell comes into the governor's office and opens up his jacket and has a stack of envelopes that are donations, and he said, this is the way we control government. This is the way you get things done in South Carolina. Now, I had a senator tell me that, but he won't allow me to say who it is. Because <laughs> he doesn't want the rest of them thinking he's going to squill on everything that goes on. He's one of our friends. He's a good fighter. We need somebody that will go in there who is a good fighter and who will tell those stories, who will tell us what's going on in caucus meetings. That's what we need to do. Now, we're out of time. I want to introduce Wes Howard, running for county council. He is a petition candidate. So if you go vote straight party ticket, he will not get your vote. Paula, uh, you're so good to get me one minute and I've got to leave. Okay. And I don't need more than one minute. All right, hang on just a second. Okay. Also, Mike Krasovsky, who uh, has run for Congress, who um, was running for Senate, State Senate. Uh, just was thinking about it. Was thinking about it. <laughs> um, I encourage him to, because he's one of these guys who will go in there and expose what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, was also a delegate to the National Convention in Florida. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and would love to hear what happened down there. Uh, but we are out of time. It's 8 o'clock. So what, what I'm going to do is, uh, is Colonel Slim, 60 seconds. Okay. <laughs> and then, and then we're going to end. Right? Oh, and school board candidate. Who's our school board candidate? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Kelvin. Okay.